everybody. My name is Spencer Walsh. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We have a good and very, very important show for you, as I'm sure you've heard by now. Uh, Roe v. Wade, the legal case that pretty much constitutionally guaranteed a woman's right to choose to have an abortion uh, here in the United States, had just been overturned by our Supreme Court. And really, what is a pretty remarkable day? Uh, we're going to take a look at how it happened, the decision, um, you know, what justices said, what, um, you know, and just the immense levels of just shame that so many people have right now in the country. That a right that we thought was so, you know, just kind of almost taken for granted, um, was just allowed to completely just lapse on us by a nine person council of people that were five out of six of the people who overturned women's rights to say were appointed by uh, justices or appointed by presidents who lost the popular vote again really little to no democratic recourse for any of this and really an incredible culmination of a fight that has been going on in a violent way from America's religious right for quite a long time now. So we're going to take a look at all the details, give you everything you need to know on this matter, and tell you, you know, really, frankly, what could be next. All right, we're looking at the top line of the news here as we look at this uh, situation. So, so finally here, this is Adam Liptak of the New York Times. The Supreme Court on Friday overruled Roe v. Wade, eliminating the constitutional right to an abortion after almost 50 years in a decision that will transform American life, reshape the nation's politics, and lead to all but total bans on the procedure in about half of the states. I mean, we are already seeing uh, some pretty crazy uh, situations right now. Like, um, the ruling came in just around after, you know, 10 p.m., like, just as, just as I woke up about, you know, an hour or so ago, um, a hour, little, little, little over like an hour and a half ago. Um, and it really is kind of a remarkable situation because there were people in there waiting for their abortion procedure that were told, you know, sorry, we can't legally perform this procedure. And that is just going to be a case, a, a, just a really example of what American life is going to be like, what we're going to be dealing with, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. And this is just, this is really, I think, just going to be the start. Um, I think the second paragraph here that the New York Times chose to kind of put this in the way that they put this, the ruling will test the the legitimacy of the court. I I remember seeing polls last night before this release, 25% of Americans have faith in our Supreme Court at the moment. Um, you know, this just kind of shows you really how strong our institutions are. I mean, they're there, they're enforcing decisions, people are reacting to these these decisions, but so many people have so little respect for these decisions. I mean, all I think really all it takes is one singular person for to come along and really just pr- push these institutions. I think Trump did that in a big way, uh, really f- uh, fundamentally kind of weakening all these people who said he couldn't win, he he can't win, it's impossible for him to do all the things that he did, and then, of course, he did them. Um, you know, I think this is, you know, another example. All these times where we say, oh, you know, these rights are enshrined, you know, all these people lying to us in the Supreme Court, pers- like in the, the these justices and these hearings saying, oh, Roe v. Wade is settled law, you know, we genuinely believe that. Um, and I think it's just, you know, it just all, all it takes is one more I think, like one more little push, uh, you know, and the legitimacy of these courts will be con- continually, um, you know, threatened and pushed. And, you know, as, as we continue to see, you know, our institutions, you know, descend into complete and total kind of political partisanship. Um, yeah. So the ruling, yeah, it'll test the legitimacy of the court, legitimacy of the court and vindicate a decades long Republican project of installing conservative justices prepared to reject the president. Uh, which had been repeatedly reaffirmed by earlier courts. It will also uh, be one of the single legacies of President Donald J. Trump, who vowed to name justices that would overrule Roe. I mean, it's not just Trump. This has been, you know, it's it's kind of dangerous here to put this on Trump. This The thing about this situation here is this is a continual pro- process that has resulted in, um, you know, from the moment Roe v. Wade was ruled on many years ago, um, you know, it has been 
really, um, you know, just continuously through, you know, whether it's bombing abortion clinics, creation of the Federalist Society, all of this, you know, legal precedent that's being set up to uh, legal, like, justices being uh, being uh, put in, judges being put in. I mean, a complete effort to completely and fundamentally um, overturn and completely, you know, move to the right the nature of the, the, the judicial system. This is this has not just been Donald Trump. This has been happening for way longer than Donald Trump. I mean, and I think it could not have happened. And this is the important point that you're not going to hear in a lot of other places today. It could not have happened without the complicity of the Democratic Party um, from either just saying, you know, it won't be that big of a deal. Abortion rights aren't a priority. Um, like Obama said way back in, in 2009, RBG staying on um, pretty much for her legacy and, you know, refusing to retire, dropping dead in the Supreme Court um, when another, you know, a liberal justice could have been put as a replacement. Of course, Amy Coney Barrett, probably one of the deciding votes of the decision today was, was put in. Um, and I mean, already we're seeing we're seeing a, a pretty remarkable move on this issue. I mean, uh, this is this is from uh, reporter Matt Ford of the um, uh, reporter Matt Ford from the New Republic. Um, he said, and it, he's writing from in a solo concurring opinion. Thomas said the court should reconsider rulings that protect contraception, same sex relationships, and same sex marriage. So that is something that is just. I, I think you know it, it's foolish, Randall, to look at that and say, "Oh no, it's not a big deal. It won't really matter." No, this is the stuff that is coming down the pike, whether we like it or not. And it's going to be not only are we going to because before Roe v. Wade passed, we were already in a pretty miserable situation. Now we have, you know, a Supreme Court and a Republican Party that is really hell bent at rolling back all of the civil rights that have been earned, you know, over the course of the past, you know, shall we say 60 years, 70 years. I mean, the, we're, we're talking about some really basic stuff. Like, literally, the gay marriage rights. Uh, so, yeah, Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. That's contraception, same-sex relationships, and same-sex marriage. That, that, this is just a start for what they want to do. Um, and it's going to happen all across the country here. So, I mean, and meanwhile, this is um, this is a tweet from reporter Dylan Wells. Just ap- just asked Whip Clyburn about the Dobbs decision. He said, quote, it's a little anticlimactic. I think we all expected this. And I'm hopeful, you know, I have to read the decision to see exa- exactly the extent to which we can move legislatively to respond to it. I mean, dude, you had all you knew it was coming. You could have responded to it legislatively. You don't care about responding to it legislatively. You don't want to respond to it legislatively. And you only want to say you're going to respond to it legislatively so you can get people to vote for you in the midterms. Like, this is the consistent model, the business model of the Democratic Party, which is to, um, you know, shame you and say, vote for us, vote for us, vote for us. You need to, like, protect your country and vote for us. And then when you do vote for the the people that you're, you're told you're supposed to vote for, um, you know, and they don't do anything, you're told that you didn't vote hard enough. And you were the one, you didn't vote hard enough last time when an historic amount of young people came out to deliver on a silver platter Joe Biden, uh, you know, the presidency. You know, Joe Biden did not win that presidency. You know, people out there organizing in the wake of Black Lives Matter while Joe Biden was too scared to come out of his basement. I mean, that is who won him the presidency. And the Democratic Party just does not care. They think they did it all. They think they did it all, and they think everyone owes them everything. You could, you cannot see the more clear attitude of entitlement from people like Jim Clyburn, from people like Nancy Pelosi, who's out there today holding a press conference, millions of scared women around, who probably think this woman is going to, you know, in a, some kind of position to do something. What does she do? Reads a poem. Um, you know, this is not going to be, uh, I think, a, a really a good situation. Um, for anybody. Um, note the majority in today's gun decision dismissed the mid-COVID-19, uh, mid-COVID-19 gun control laws as too new slash removed from the 1790s to establish his historical president. But in the leaked Alito brief, the same majority cited restrictions in uh, late COVID-19 as historic foundation. They're not really even trying. So yeah, this uh, is a logical inconsistency about you know restrictions there in the Supreme Court. 
Um, and of course, you know, just yesterday, what did they do? Um, you know, last night they struck down the Supreme, same same Supreme Court struck down um, New York's concealed carry law. So pretty much that's a huge step in the wrong direction on gun control. Even after that little baby step that came out of the Senate. I mean, it is really not a you know encouraging situation at all. Um, and so long past the time uh, to we need to dismiss the idea that this court operates as an apolitical judiciary. Um, it's a third branch of unelected life-term super legislators. They don't need coherent arguments, only enough pretense to justify their opinion, and just barely. I think that's a really great point. You got, it's it, These people, we have to stop pretending that they're any kind of partisan or any kind of like bipartisan or nonpartisan people that, you know, just have to, you know, just interpret the law in the best way that they can, regardless of the kind. Like that per, just awful statement at the end of their um you know, majority opinion today, which is like we don't we don't pretend to know how um, people will respond to this. You know, but we're just here doing our job, interpreting the Constitution the best way we can. You know, these, this this bill this um this opinion is riddled with tons of logical inconsistencies and you know horrific arguments um, that just continue to go against every you know established standard. In what you know, and what we just expect from our our country, on, just on a on a normal basis, and the even part, I don't even know what was scary that we have this force here, or that we have literally nobody to stop it. We got with Nancy Pelosi out there already sending out fundraising emails off of this decision when literally she just helped the only anti-abortion Democrat running. The entire House leadership went down to Texas to comp- to campaign for Henry Cuellar, who was a House, uh, rep- uh, essentially House Republican, but Democrat who received an A rating from the NRA um, and who is unabashedly, uh, you know, despite being literally under a criminal investigation, unabashedly pro-life, unabashedly. And Nancy Pelosi was down there. Jim Clyburn was down there. They pulled out all the stops to help this guy beat off a progressive challenger. And, you know, they succeeded just barely. But was that worth it? You know, I mean, and I think for them, it honestly, it was. They don't care about this. They just do not care. For them, this is just a completely cynical game where pretty much all that they they have to do, all that they really care about, all that they, you know, all that, you know, keeps the game going on from them is those fundraising emails. All the, like, the the people who, like Jim Clyburn, people like that, the only thing that they care about is that bottom uh, bottom quarter line, you know, sending out those fundraising emails, um, you know, the FEC deadline's coming up, have we hit our deadline that is what that is how politics operates for them. They don't like, and it's just so far removed from any kind of normal conception of a political party. Like what we saw with the Republicans over the last, you know, forty, fifty years. I think whenever Roe v. Wade, I think it was in the seventies, sometime. It doesn't matter now; it's all gone. But I mean, that was a real political movement that was a real political party intent on achieving a fundamental goal intent on changing american ways of life you know that that's what happened there but on the same time we saw a complete hollowing out from the democratic party of any type of political will any type of political power um and i mean it is so so scary because there are really no options in terms of a you know fundamental response to the situation just on just on the basis of it. I mean, it's it's been really clear. So Obama, as early as two thousand, we can look back through this this entire situation. Nobody is blameless. I mean, you go go back to April 29, two thousand nine. Obama elected a supermajority in the Senate. I mean, it, he had pretty much all the power in the world. This is right after he got in. Um, you know, he he says Obama says abortion rights law not a top priority. That could have that could have reversed this. This could have been you know we could have been like every other civilized country that has abortion, um, you know, and protected by law, like for example, like what Ireland just did you know, a few years back. And you know that's another thing. We are more of a barrack today in the eyes of the world. We are more we we take a step back in the eyes of the world. As you know, one of the few countries that you know, one of the only if not the only developed country 
that doesn't get guarantee a right to abortion as well as, you know, things like health care, you know, free college, things like that. Um, you know, that is another, uh, you know, mark on our standing with the rest of the world. And also, I think it shows that these rights that everybody thought were going to be at least relatively well protected, although it was kind of clear where this was going, if you were kind of paying attention from the, from the Amy Coney Barrett decision onward when, when she was first confirmed to the Supreme Court. I mean, it was kind of clear that this thing was essentially dead in the water. I mean, like, this now, I think, should open the door for many Americans who, like, they just didn't think it was possible. I was, you know, I was surprised by it when it first came out because I thought, I mean, I guess it, I wasn't surprised by it, but it was just still just so... Because if you look at the situation logically, you know, because I, I, I got to be honest, sometimes I still have that, you know, very, like, centrist kind of... um establishment political break. like you know it really couldn't get, actually get this bad this fast like there's going to be some sort of reason within the system like I, I just was not looking at it logically it's to a certain point you know but if you had asked me still at the time like is roe v wade likely to be overturned i said like you know you got amy coney bear there you got a federal society slate of judges who are all put in position to do exactly this but you know no i still think john roberts is going to say no it's, it's so silly like this is what they're there for this is what they were put in place to do and you know it should not be a surprise that this is what they did. I mean, I think we are, you know, this this just opens the door. This like we, this is it. We are living in a world where rights that people have gone their whole lives knowing as their own are now being actively taken away from us. Um, you know, just people that we know, people that we care about. If it's not you, it'll be you next. Like that is just how this thing works. Always worked throughout history. Um, you know, it's been it's been very clear. So. You know, Obama promised to sign the Freedom of Choice Act on day one and has not touched the issue since. This is from back in 2008. The first thing he said he'll do as president signed the Freedom of Choice Act, this is the abortion law that many people wanted him to sign, apparently didn't think it was a big priority. Now, what do we get from him today? Um, you know, today the Supreme Court has not only reversed 50 years of precedent, or relegated the most intensely personal decisions someone can make to the whims of of politicians and ideologues attacking the essential freedoms of millions of Americans. Across the country, <coughs> states have already passed bills restricting choice. If you're looking for ways to respond, PPFA, USO Women, and many other groups sounding alarm on the issue for years, and it will continue to be on the front lines of the fight. Um, you know, it's it's just so, you know, it's just so hopeless. And, and like, it's it's people, I think, are also starting to get a sense that they can't do anything either. Because it's just it's just really worried. This is from a future guest on the show, a good friend of the show, Jack Neeker. Um, he was tweeting. He was out in um, in Paris on a vacation with his family and was saying, you know, um, we're in a museum in Paris when the road decision was just announced and started talking about it with fellow Americans. They were very angry and said, we're going to go march and protest. My dad very correctly pointed out that that exact reaction was the most distressing part. There's no real or imagined way of positively affecting things in America. No organized or governmental means of resistance. Just fluctuating anger and outrage. Yeah, that, that part about fluctuating anger and outrage and no real means of, you know, government resistance. It's just so, it just hits so clearly because it's just like, you know, what are we supposed to do about this thing? Like, what are we g supposed to do? Um, are we supposed to vote for Democrats? Are we supposed to... I don't know, put him in charge of the presidency, House, and Senate like they are literally right now, you know? Are, are you supposed to give him even more votes? Is that is that what it's going to do? I mean, no. Like, we have to admit here, these are completely broken, fundamentally institutions, you know, that are not focused on protecting us um, and not focused on, you know, protecting people's rights, not focused on doing what they say they're going to do to American people. I mean, that is just the reaction of the situation. So, um uh, John Roberts on Roe, uh, he called it, quote, he settled as a president of the court. Gorsuch, a good judge, will consider it as president. Kavanaugh, an important president. Barrett, so well settled that no political actors and no people seriously push for their overruling. Um, you know, this is, this is what they all said at the time of confirmation. And, I mean, nobody should have believed them. Nobody, um, you know, honestly should have taken this at kind of any any in any way seriously i mean it is you know frankly embarrassing if you're your people like susan collins 
um, who are out there saying, <laughs> Justice Kavanaugh will protect the right to abortion, uh, you know, on the Senate floor, letting that, you know, likely sexual assaulter get on the Supreme Court. I mean, it is hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine, you know, what they're what they're feeling. But if I had to guess, I mean, they probably don't care. They probably don't care because they know it won't affect them. Um and, you know, they won't act. So it is very, very clear. And it's going to be interesting to see, you know, where we go next. It's going to be interesting to see, I think, where we, uh, you know, what rights are targeted next. We're already seeing right now a national abortion ban being pushed by Republicans. You know, if they win back things in the midterms, if they if they regain control of Congress, that'll be very, very easy for them to do. Because, like I said, they are a functioning political party. They set political goals they work ruthlessly to achieve them and steamroll anything by any means necessary take out anything in their way so that is what they're going to do and you know who again what i keep coming back to they're going to keep going they're going to keep pushing for the obliteration of people's rights and you know who is going to stop them who is going to stop them um yeah so it is very very scary uh, to say the least, um, but yeah, so here we have Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor in their dissent, um, really conveying the tr- full truth of the, uh, really dystopian decision we see today. From the very moment of fertilization, a woman has no rights to speak of, uh, she's, uh, this is the, this is from the dissent opinion of, um, Dobbs versus Jackson, and I mean, it is, people just don't know what to do, Uh, it's a very, very, really a remarkable situation, and I think what really remains to be seen in terms of the the violence of this regime that is going to be coming out there enforcing abortion, how bad is it going to be, how bad is it going to get, how, you know, how severe will punishments be, I'm sure it'll vary state by state for for women who go through with this kind of situation, you know, how bad will it be in terms of, um, the targeting of these people will we see kind of uh, neighbors turning on neighbors like the Texas law encouraged will be people kind of sticking together. Will these blue states like Illinois, New York uh, companies who are now putting up money for people to pay for, you know, if you're uh, working at a Tesla factory in Texas, you can go to California and get an abortion uh, paid for by the company. Um, and that is going to come under attack. How more, how much more vigilant, Will they go and how successful will they be able to turn up their their war on women, their war on gay people, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, it's going to be, you know, the, the reward on just basic social freedom whatsoever um, is going to be turned up. Um, and how, you know, I think I think the question there, if you're looking at it, honestly, it's going to you know they're going to push it as far as they can go. You know, they're one trajectory on that, that direction. They they as a party, the Republicans as a party are fundamentally. Uh, set up to keep pushing, pushing, pushing um, until they reach the end, whatever that is. You know, there is no end in sight, it feels like. Um, but I think the real question is how easily, well, not even Democrats at this, sta- at this stage. I think, like, it's beyond, we progress beyond, you know, Democrats at this point. I think, like, w- the question is how, as as Americans, how will, how easy will it be for them to just, like, take it from us how for, th- for these rights how easy will it be for them to just say no we're taking it away um i think that's going to be a very interesting question uh to say the least um so it, it, it's going to be very very interesting so we will take a a, a quick look at this we got 13 states already with trigger laws uh that ban abortion automatically going into effect um the first anti-abortion movement in the United States was explicitly white supremacist and patriarchal, made up mostly of doctors who organized the movement for the purpose of pushing women out of the medical field and increase the birth rate among white women. So just that's the kind of um, long-time, um, you know, genesis of this, going back decades upon decades upon decades, and you know, it is it is very very interesting. We're going to continue to to follow the situation. Um, you know, and, and and bring you pretty much the latest on everything that is going on here. We'll, we'll keep you up to date. We'll keep you posted. This is News Flash on the day of Roe v. Wade being overturned by the Supreme Court.
My name is Spencer Walsh. This is the Spencer Walsh Radio Network. And if you are listening to one of our podcasts, whether it's Newsflash, Hidden History, The Spencer Walsh Show, or something else, ladies and gentlemen, we have one simple request of you. Please be sure to rate us, subscribe to us if you like us, and leave us a comment because just like all of you, sometimes we need that feedback in our lives, good or bad. We want to hear what you have to say. So please do those steps. Make SWR and content better. And thank you so much for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got some polls um, you know, to look at for you here today. Support from not overturning Roe versus Wade. Marquette from January, 72%. Pew from 2019, 70%. SSRS from January 2022, 69%, 60%. Um, you know, we're, so stretching all back, nothing below 55% in terms of uh, support for not overturning Roe v. Wade. And this is not like guaranteeing, you know, abortion, like, on demand or whatever, like that's obviously a much more polarizing issue. But this, as a basic standard, I said this at the time when the the leaked decision came out. Um, you know, this is just a this is not. There's a difference between saying you're like pro abortion or pro Roe v. Wade. It's a different standard, um, and it just is something that uh, really is just kind of the bare minimum in terms of uh, abortion rights. Abortion had already been under so many deep deep restrictions in that half the Republican half of the country. Um, and for this to, for, for, and you know, that Roe v. Wade did nothing about that. You know, it, the, the president was still be able, was able to be still kind of manipulated, turned, um, in, into, you know, all these very high barriers of entry for abortion clinics to meet that would make it impossible for them to be able to con- pursue these abortions in these red states. But, you know, it's, it's very, very clear that this is not going to be slowing down anytime soon. Chief Justice John G. Roberts voted with a majority but said he would have taken a more measured course, stopping short of overruling Roe outright. The three courts, uh, of course, three liberal members dissented, so pretty much the, the draft remained pretty much unchanged, uh, which pretty much confirms the, the theory of the right wing leaker, actually, that um, they leaked it because they didn't want uh, Supreme Court, um, you know, they didn't want people to lose their nerve over this. People like Roberts, people who may have been on the fence, maybe a Gorsuch or something like that, um, on this issue, and to hold them accountable and make sure that they stuck with what they wrote down in this kind of leaked draft. So, yeah, so the case is is Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. This is the case that can take away your abortion rights. Um, It it concerned a law enacted by uh, the Republican-dominated Mississippi legislature in 2018 that banned abortions if the probable gestational age of the unborn human was determined to be more than 15 weeks. Uh, The statute uh, calculated challenge to Roe included narrow exceptions for medical emergencies or even a severe fetal abnormality. Uh, Mississippi's sole abortion clinic sued, saying it ran afoul of Roe and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, the 1992 decision that affirmed Roe's core holding. Um, lower courts ruled for the clinic, saying the law was plainly unconstitutional under Roe, which prohibited state, states from banning abortions before fetal viability, the point at which fetuses can sustain life outside the womb, which is currently about 23 weeks. Judge Carlton W. Reeves, the Federal District Court of Jackson, Mississippi, blocked the law in 2018, saying the legal issue was straightforward and questioning state lawmakers' motives, saying you're clearly trying to get a case up to the Supreme Court that can overturn Roe v. Wade. Writing, the state chose to pass a law it knew was unconstitutional to endorse a decades-long campaign fueled by national interest groups to ask the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. This court follows the commands of the Supreme Court and the dictates um, of the United States Constitution rather than the disingenuous calculations of the Mississippi legislature. Uh, yeah, so he, he really went in there and was like, you know, we see what you're trying to do. The Supreme Court ruled on this already. Well, unfortunately, they have ruled on it again. Um you know, um, a three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, New Orleans, affirmed Judge Reeves' ruling, um, saying, in an unbroken line dating to Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court's abortion cases have been established and affirmed and reaffirmed a woman's right to choose an abortion before viability. That key 23-week mark 
Was Patrick E. Higginbotham wrote for the majority. In a ruling for the state, the Supreme Court did not did more than merely sustain the Mississippi law, leaving questions about stricter. Um, Sorry, in ruling for the state, the Supreme Court did more than merely sustain the Mississippi law, leaving questions about stricter limits for another day. Instead, it overruled Roe outright. It said, 15 weeks? No, we're going lower than that. When the court established Roe in 1973, it established a framework to govern abortion regulation based on the trimesters of the pregnancy. In the first trimester, it allowed no, almost no regulations. In the second, it allowed regulations to protect women's health. In the third, it allowed states to ban abortion so long as exceptions were made to protect the life, life and health of the mother. So that's pretty much how it worked. The standard there uh, set up by trimesters, how much you can regulate a pregnancy based on what trimester it's in. Um, the court discarded the trimester framework in 1992 in the Casey decision, but retained what it called Roe's essential holding that women have a constitutional right to terminate their pregnancies until fetal viability. Um, two years ago, in June 2020, the Supreme Court struck down a restrictive Louisiana abortion law by a five to four margin. That's again when the court was still more liberal, with Justice John Roberts providing the decisive vote. His concurring opinion, which expressed respect for the president but proposed a relatively relaxed standard for evaluating restrictions, signaled an incremental approach to cutting back on abortion rights, pretty much what he's always wanted to do. But that was before Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died that September. Um, her replacement was Justice Amy Coney Barrett, a conservative who has spoken out against abortion on demand, changing the power dynamic of the court, and diminishing the Chief Justice's power to guide the pace of change, something he's probably very uncomfortable with, to be completely honest. Um, you know, and it's that's that's kind of where we are now. Like, this, this these rights, the, the, the trimester standard, the viability standard, uh, have been fundamentally eroded, and that is quite... A situation. So, um, we are looking at reactions across the country today. Uh, Republican state legislatures, leaders, and anti-abortion activists who have worked to overturn Roe v. Wade literally since it was ruled on celebrated the Supreme Court's decision, saying it was a culmination of a decades-long effort to restrict abortion. State Rep. Becky Curie, a main author of the Mississippi 2018 House bill banning abortions after 15 weeks, said that. Uh, that was at the center of the Supreme Court decision and said that this should be a happy day for us all. Um, I think God has had his hands in this from the very beginning. Mr. Curry said, no, it was the Federal Society, but whatever. Um, now the work begins. So, yeah, see, they're not done. They're telling you here, folks, they are not done with this. Um we need to be there for them to make sure both birth control is available. We need to make sure homes are available for babies to be adopted. Um, so yeah, they're just going to, who knows? I don't, I don't even know what that means. Um, in Arkansas state Senator Ben Gilmore, a Republican said this is a state's rights issue. Now it can be rightfully decided on the state level. The decision has been a long time coming as Senator Gilmore was responding to the state's trigger law. This is in Arkansas, um, that following decision now effectively bans abortion in the state. The law signed by Governor Asa Hutchington, Hutchinson in 2021 bans nearly all abortions except to save the life of a pregnant woman in medical emergency and does not provide exceptions of rape or incest. He said the legislature was willing to keep an open mind, but he doesn't believe that it would revisit the law to make exceptions for rape and incest. Um, rape and incest is certainly a traumatic and horrific event, um, but it would make it what would make it more horrific is the decision to take the innocent life of your child. Ugh, it's just un unbelievable. Um, adding the state has offered legal resources and legal protections to help victims in, in these instances. It's just, you know, the, the, the it, there's nothing else to say. Like, the, 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 the depravity of this really small minority of the country. Like, the, we're talking about 20, 30 no more than 40% of the country here that legitimately falls into this camp and now will have, you know, huge and mostly a male portion of the country that will have the ability to control the bodies of mostly poor women, mostly uh, women of color. And that is going to be a situation that is just so just horrific and depressing. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to even put it into words. Dale Barcher, the executive uh, director of the South Dakota Right to Life group said he was thrilled by the Supreme Court decision. Um, quite honestly, if I had a convenient, I would be tossing it high. Um, you know, and this is they, this is what they did. They 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 saw, they work for this. They have been working for this since 1973 when this ruling was passed. 
Uh, that is just the reality of the situation. I mean, it is, um, it is, it is really there to, um, it it is really there to you know it, it it was there happening right in front of us, and you know our political leaders, our you know democratic people who are there to you know supposed to be there to save abortion. That's what they were promising. We they were like, that's what they were supposed to be there for. Um, have utterly failed, utterly abandoned their constituents, utterly abandoned women, um, and this is why we are where we are now. And it's hard to imagine, you know, it, just how much more we can take as Americans, as citizens, before things start to just really break. Um, at a Planned Parenthood Health Center in Florida's Gulf Coast, new restrictions and who can get an abortion are shaking up routines and creating challenges for the clinic's patients, doctors, and nurses. The center in Fort Myers has seen a steady influx of patients from other states that have tightened access to the procedure over the past year. It also uh, is adjusting to a waiting period that took effect in Florida in April after years of litigation requiring patients seeking an abortion to have an ultrasound then at least wait 24 at least, wait at least 24 hours before returning for the actual procedure. And the new state law bidding most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy is set to take effect in just a few days on the 1st of July. So many patients in Florida get medica- medication abortions, which involve taking two different drugs 24 to 48 hours apart and are authorized for the first 10 weeks of pregnancy. But the center provides surgical abortions up until almost 22 weeks of pregnancy, at least until the new law takes effect. It also provides pelvic and breast exams, different types of contraception, testing and treatment for sexually transmitted diseases, and and other types of reproductive health care. Stacey DeLynn, the center's former medical director, moved back to New York City last month. She previously worked as the associate medical director for Planned Parenthood of Greater New York and would once again practice in the state where abortion will remain legal for up to 24 weeks of pregnancy or later if the fetus is not viable or the patient's life or health is at risk. Part of the reason she left Florida, she said, is that she would no longer be able to perform abortions past 15 weeks of pregnancy if the new law took effect as planned. The state you live in should, shouldn't dictate the health care you're able to access. It feels so enormously overwhelming and heartbreaking. I mean, overwhelming, I think is a great word uh, to put it, a great way to put it. Um, you know, it is just so hard. Um, you know, Nancy Pelosi is saying it's overwhelming. I mean, she let it happen, but for the people out there who need this healthcare, I mean, like who haven't, you know, fundamentally compl- stood by and watched as Republicans mounted a decades long campaign to overturn this law, for those people, you know, it's got to be just absolutely just crazy. It's got to be so scary. I, I, like, you know, I'm obviously in a position where, you know, I myself, will never need an abortion but you know that shouldn't matter like you if you know a woman anywhere if you're uh in a relationship with a woman you know like just anyone who's concerned about kindness and decency and you know just a a better world um where people where suffering is just generally reduced you know this should be a very very disturbing and dispiriting decision um yeah so it it is 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 really tough. So, from from now, you know, thanks to this leadership, uh, and she's saying it right here. Um, now to see young girls have even fewer rights than their moms or even their grandmothers had in this country, it is it is quite something, I think, to say the least. Um, there's some um, interesting reaction, even from people like Boris Johnson, calling the Supreme Court decision a big step backward. Um, he spoke at a news conference in Rwanda at a meeting of the Commonwealth countries. He acknowledged the ruling was from another jurisdiction, but added it has a massive impact on people's thinking around the world. It's a very important decision. I think it's a big step backward. I've always said that th- I believed in a women's right to choose, and I stick to that view, and that's why the UK has the laws that it does. On the West Coast, the governors of California, Oregon, and Washington have just issued a joint statement pledging to protect access to abortion and contraceptives and defend patients and doctors from abortion bans in other states. So, again, I think the next thing here on this this issue is going to be the abortion uh, the abortion ban, the nationwide abortion ban that people like Mike Pence, uh, likely, uh, you know, contender for Republican power in the future, is going to be very, very clear. Um, you know, that is what they're going for next. They're trying to take rights away there. They're trying to come after, um, 
other ways that people could get abortions. They're going to try to make it a crime punishable by, you know, who knows what, when it comes down to it in this country. And that is a very, very scary decision. Um, and something that we will definitely have to keep keep watching. It's like it, it, as tough as it, it may be, you know, it is just such a as despairing as it may be. I mean, what more? What else can we do than just keep pushing? Like th- there is, you know, it's so you know overwhelming. There's no denying how overwhelming it is. Um, you know, it is, you know, it it is very very, it's very very tough. Um. Jonah Furman here with a great tweet. He's a labor reporter uh, for Labor Notes. Uh, what can you say? We are powerless before these overlords and everyone who allowed this, who had the power to stop it, uh, but did not codify it into law, who, uh, talking about abortion here, who had the responsibility to stop the fascists but failed to. We are all complicit. We have to win. Um, yeah, so a very, very tough and kind of just disgusting day here. Owen Higgins, who's another independent kind of lefty media reporter here, had a great th- thread today, uh, kind of thanking everybody. Uh, thanks especially to RBG for making this uh, possible. Also, thanks to, Ob- uh, to Obama for not recess appointing Garland or whoever to replace Scalia. You're in action and failed presidency helped make this moment a reality. Cle- clear- clearly, the right-wing um, ghouls that have been pushing this for decades are monsters, but they aren't exactly subtle here. So yes, in my view, a large amount of blame goes to RBG for not retiring and Obama for not acting. Um, Democrats have only one solution. Vote for us so we can fail you again and blame you for not voting hard enough. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> The funny thing here is, um, you know, they'll be ho- <laughs> he also continues to write here, oh yeah, I forgot, they'll be holding a hearing in July because they can't be bothered to cut their vacation short um you know that's that's the best they can do we'll, we'll get a hearing for you we're gonna explore the post real reality here in america um what a joke uh meanwhile here's reality for you little nothings who don't have money or power um you know this is from the washington post when the decision came shortly after 10 a.m many of the clinics in trigger band states were filled with patients scheduled to receive abortion care administrations administrators had to afford patients they could not longer legally perform the abortion. Um, you know, we got Mike Pence calling for a national abortion ban. Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin has stopped scheduling abortions after June 25th in anticipation of the SCOTUS ruling overturning Roe. The state would revert to an 1849 law banning abortions except when necessary to save the mother's, mother's life. Uh, so that's where Wisconsin is at the moment. It is, this is a Democratic state, Democratic governor. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts with the midterms goes on. Um, you know, a, a, a throw and that, you know, people can't help thinking of people like Diane Feinstein hugging Lindsey Graham after the Amy Coney Barry hearing for God knows what reason, maybe like she thought it was her like long lost son or something, who knows, um, saying, I just want to thank you. This has been one of the best set of hearings that I participated in. Thank you so much for your leadership. Um, Senator Joe Manchin said he trusted Justice Gorsuch and Justin Kavanaugh, when they testified under oath that they believed Roe v. Wade was set to legal president, and I'm alarmed they chose to reject the stability in the ruling that has provided two generations. Uh, this reject the stability the ruling has provided for two generations of Americans. Um, just ask Whip Clyburn about the Dobbs decision. It's a little anticlimactic. I think y'all expect to see this is the this Clyburn quote I read earlier. Um, and I mean, yeah, people just finished supporting Henry Clare, an anti-abortion Democrat. Now they're going to tell you that they're going to be the ones to support, you know, the the next wave to fight back against this horrific legal regime here. You know, don't buy it. It's bullshit. It's frankly bullshit. They're not here to do any of this stuff. They're only here to keep making money off of you as they have for the entire length of their rotten political careers. So, yeah, with that being said, I think the, the biggest conclusion here is that this momentum has to come from you, has to come from the people. It's just the way it has to be. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening today. That's all the time we got. We'll see you next time.